Thanks for the intro, Lucas, and uh, thanks to Amanda as well, uh, to, and to everybody for coming out. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story uh, about, well, fitting with the theme about a man who started out life uh, not a man, uh, the son of a slave, uh, and a slave himself, who then rose to be somewhat more than a man, a kind of great hero of well, as Lucas gave away, a French society, but then who was cut down and ended his life, again, not a, a man, in fact, quite erased, obliterated from um, society and then from, from history itself. And it's also the story of an author who spent his life trying to write this man, his, his own father, back into history and to give him, um, again, his status as, as a man. Well, our hero started out life, um, as I said, the son of a slave, a black slave, and a French aristocrat in the French sugar island of Saint-Domingue, later Haiti, in the middle of the 18th century, at the time when Saint-Domingue was the center of the world sugar trade, and sugar was to the world economy what oil is today, or to keep with the white powder, basically what cocaine was a few years ago. It was the most valuable commodity in the world. It was the thing that men were most willing to kill and to uh, be killed for. Well, his father was a aristocrat, his mother was a slave, and his uncle was a slave dealer who sold sugar and slaves out of a little cove in the north of Haiti called Monte Cristo. And, um, well, his father was the eldest son of this noble family, and he got word from France that if he could make his way back to Europe, he could inherit a great fortune. So he promptly sold our hero, his favorite son, to buy his own ship ticket. But in fact, he didn't sell our hero. He pawned him, and I know he pawned him because, well, I am a historian and a journalist, and I have to write my stories based on evidence. So I actually found the pawn ticket where he had written, um, I am selling my son, but I have the right to buy him back if I inherit my fortune, and indeed he did this. So a year later, in the fall of 1776, our hero arrives in Normandy, listed in a ship's manifest, I found, as the slave Alexander, as a piece of cargo. Well, within a year, this slave Alexander is being trained at the finest fencing school in France um, in, well, in, in swordsmanship, but also riding, philosophy, all of the manners, all of the things that a gentleman needs. And he now has the title of Count because his father has inherited the title of Marquis. But as you can imagine, he has some issues with his father who has recently bought and sold him and has also left his mother and the rest of the family behind. And when he's 20 years old, he storms off and join, he, he throws off his noble title and goes to enlist in essentially the lowest thing you can do as a noble in French society. He enlists in the army at a non-officer's rank. He enlists as a private in the cavalry. And he's stationed to a remote garrison town where he specializes in fighting duels. This now is 1786. Well, when the French Revolution breaks out, this young man sees his chance, and he forms something called the Legion of Free Americans, also known as the Black Legion. And it's called the Black Legion because not only our hero, but all of the other members of this group of cavalrymen are actually black. They're all actually sons um, of slaves, usually their mothers are slaves, and usually their fathers are, are aristocrats. But because of their slave heritage, they all want to fight for the revolution. So essentially, he is now part of a troop of black cavalrymen 
who are based near Paris and who are there to fight for the revolution, for the French Revolution and for the ideals of liberty, equality and fraternity which they think will really be the basis of um, freeing people uh, by race as well as uh, by class. And um, well, along the way he does a lot of, this is, I haven't, I've just sort of scraped the beginning of his adventures but um, shortly after, right during the beginning of the revolution, he rides into a little village and uh, there he happens to meet an innkeeper's daughter named Marie Louise and they happen to fall madly in love. And I tell you this because their son will be the novelist Alexandre Dumas. And in fact, their son is the author who will spend his life really trying to tell his father's story, but to tell it um, the way he knows how he's turning it into um, some of the greatest fictional characters of all time, um, basically the Three Musketeers, but especially the Count of Monte Cristo. And that's because, well, fast forwarding after there are a few more years of incredible things that this man does during the revolution um, and as a soldier and then as a general, uh, and by the way, his name is General Alex Dumas, General Alexander Dumas. He's the same name as his son, the novelist. But really the most incredible thing that uh, General Alex Dumas does is to survive this ordeal where he's thrown into a dungeon and turned again from after he's risen to the level of being one of the greatest uh, heroes in, in France. And by the way, he's, he, he's actually, the historical side of it is he rises to the equivalent of the rank of four-star general. And no African-American um, officer will attain this rank in a white army until basically Colin Powell does at the end of the 20th century. So 200 years before the fact, I mean, he does something historically in, quite incredible, although it's then completely erased from history. But after this, I mean, he, he, he fights his way across much of Europe, Italy, and then in fact, he even is the cavalry commander on the French invasion of Egypt, so he fights his way across the Middle East. And, um, but then he is thrown in this dungeon for reasons he can't fathom, and everything he's accomplished is taken away from him, and he is turned again into basically not into a non-person, into a number. And of course, that is then the basis of his son's greatest story, The Count of Monte Cristo. And um, well, writing and researching this story, you know, was amazing to, it brought me into this entire world where the French Revolution emancipated, created the world's first uh, emancipated society or, or really the first integrated society where there were black four-star generals, our hero, but there was also, uh, there were black politicians at the top of the French government, and there was even an integrated school system in Paris for this very short window of time. So all of this was fascinating, but none of this was the reason that I came upon this story or that I am here talking about it to you today. The reason that I came upon it is because, as you might guess from the way that I began, I am a lifelong fan of the novels of Alexandre Dumas and of the works of Alexandre Dumas from the time I was really a little boy. I mean, I have um, personal reasons why I was very attached to The Count of Monte Cristo, but by the time I was about 13 years old, I had just hunted down everything that Dumas, the novelist, um, uh, well, I haven't hunted down everything he had written because as anybody who's a fan knows, he's written he and his, uh, the people who collaborated with him wrote effectively too many books to count. Um, but all of the works I could, and among them, I hunted down something that people don't read very much, which um, hasn't really been in print uh, since the late 19th century, which are his memoirs. And this really all grew out of that. And the memoirs of Alexandre Dumas the novelist, are a very unusual document. And I mean, they're, they're, they're more than unusual, they're weird. And um, well, why do I say they're weird? Well, 
Okay, he, the novelist Dumas decided to write his memoirs when he was 45 years old, uh, right in the wake of his incredible success with the novels I've been talking about. He was at the time the most popular writer in the world. Um, and uh, he decided to sort of reflect on his life at 45. And he started and he wrote 10 volumes of this, uh, of his memoirs, of this autobiography, as it were. And by the time he got to uh, the 10th volume, he had gotten up to age 35. Now, well, th th I mean, there are a few things that are <laughs> strange about that. I mean, he did write a lot, but um, by the time he was 35, any of you who know about his biography might, might know he, he actually hadn't written a single novel or any fiction yet. So the very thing that people um, wanted to read about or the thing that made him famous had not yet happened. Um, and he was already at volume 10. And by then he got bored of, of writing this, this memoir and stopped. Um, but uh, it's a very important work and very fascinating to, to me. Um, and it, was, it changed my life, really, and it's the reason that I'm here. Um, because the other weird thing about this memoir is that, so it is an, it's basically like his autobiography, just um, starting before the beginning. In fact, he gets up to page 200 and something of volume one before he actually is born, before his own birth. So, um, yeah, this is not um, for the impatient. And, but the thing is that it's, it's not like, if you know his, his things like The Three Musketeers or, or any of his novels, he, he likes to sort of begin with big, big history and something I really, I like to do myself. I would sort of present a panorama of, of the times and, sort of of the universe and France and everything that's going on or the world. But that's not what takes him 200 pages to start his life in his memoirs. It's not that at all. It's actually, it's very personal story. It's just not personal about him. He tells the story of the man that I began by mentioning, um, of this man who was born the son of a slave and a French renegade, French aristocrat, and the story of his father. And when I read this story, when I was ab about 13 years old, it was like reading The Count of Monte Cristo, The Three Musketeers, The you know, Man in the Iron Mask, a bunch of other ones all rolled into one. But more amazing because at the center of it is this, well, guy who starts out as a black slave. And then also there is, it's set against the backdrop of the French Revolution. And all of these th things about it are just um, really amazing. And, I uh, was, you know, really struck, and then, but I was especially struck by this thing. When, when you get up to this part at page 200 where he gets to his own birth, and, and so he's born, and uh, um, as soon as he's born, he's mainly talking about his, um, you know, his first few years that he gets to spend with his father when his father is still alive, which is the time when his father has come back from the dungeon. And um, there's something very strange about the way it's described. They're, they're living in this little castle in provincial France, and his father, the great uh, hero, here's this guy who, I mean, I'm, I just mentioned a little bit about his exploits, but I mean, to give you an idea, he became a four-star general by conquering the Alps for France. Now, this is a guy who was born in, you know, in the tropics, as I said. He had not seen, uh, you know, snow until he was 16 years old. He is plunked down in the middle of the Alps in command of over 50,000 French troops, French revolutionary troops, at 14,000 feet on a glacier. They don't have boots. They don't have, you know, anything, basically. And they are uh, told by the Committee of Public Safety, you know, these sort of dictators who run France at the time, they're told that they have to take the Alps. Now, the people guarding the Alpine passes above them are the Austrians and uh, their allies, and these are the greatest Alpine troops in the world. And these ill-equipped people being led by 
a kid who grew up in Haiti are told that they, you know, conquer or die. And um, this General Dumas, in a very, something very typical of him, just is able to use, you know, he uses skills that he learned when he was a kid in Haiti, he sort of just deals with what's there. And uh, he teaches his 50,000 guys how to trap uh, the local animals, they, you know, manage to create boots for themselves, they, they figure out how to make spikes to put on those boots, they eventually climb 2,000 foot cliffs, <laughs> surprise the Austrians, he wins and he gets made a four star general. Um, but, I mean, all of these th incredible, I mean, that's just one, one thing that, that he did. And, but at the end of his life, he's living in this little castle in um, about 100 miles outside Paris, and it's, it's described in the, in the memoir, it's the son's first memories, and there's something very strange about it because it's as though they're, they're kind of ostracized and they're uh, erased and they're sort of kicked, they're marginalized from society and they're all these things that the family is not supposed to do. Among other things, um, it's illegal for them to be living there because by this point, um, well, by this point, uh, the, the, I should mention, I guess, the reason his career, the reason that the man who started out as nothing became such a great hero was then chopped down again was that he, as may as happens, um, he he clashed with another man on his way up, and this other man was also from a island outside of France who uh, arrived um, speaking actually quite poor French um, and also wanted to become a great uh, general of the revolution. And uh, his name was Napoleone Buonaparte, and Napoleone Buonaparte went to Egypt with General Alex Dumas and uh, in the middle of the desert on their way to Cairo, the two came to hate each other and, um, well, for a lot of reasons, by the time that we're in this little castle, uh, Bonaparte, who is now the Emperor Napoleon, has given laws that, that, that basically, I mean, well, he's, he's done a lot of things that, that uh, directly affect Dumas, but also every other man of color in France. He, the same month that he uh, creates the Legion of Honor, Napoleon also reinstated slavery in the French Empire and imposed race laws all over France. And these race laws specifically affect the black four-star general who is our hero because among them, he makes it illegal to marry a white, to be married to a white woman. And of course, General Dumas is, has a, a Marie Louise, his wife, so that's illegal. But there are all these odd laws, like it becomes illegal for any officer who has black blood to live within 100 kilometers of Paris, and, and that's where uh, the, they happen to be living. So they, in, in, in finding, eventually, in finding all the records and letters that I would, thousands of them, to write this book, I found these very poignant letters where the family has to appeal to Napoleon to allow uh, General Dumas to stay in the house where he, where they're living and sort of things like that. But it's, I'm coming across this for the first time in this memoir and the son is really, he's just writing with just the memory of his father as this great hero because to him he's this man who's who's sort of he's beaten and and ostracized but he's teaching him you know how to swim and how to hunt and do all these things in this little tiny environment around their castle and uh that only lasts for really a very short time and then you get to the most sort of the first really colorful really really vivid scene in this memoir which is where you sort of see the novelist talent explode and it's sort of like a scene out of one of his novels and that's the night that his father uh general dumas is dying and uh it, well the the this i guess this is all just to say this is sort of how does a i'm just giving you a glimpse of how a writer, historian, novelist, journal, or, not novelist, journalist, goes about um, uh, really getting the, uh, the thing that drove me on for years. It was something about that scene where the son is writing about his father who just a few years earlier 
had been one of the great heroes of France and is now really, as the theme of the evening, not a man, less than a man. And this really just uh, 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 grabbed me and I, I thought about it for basically the next 30 years. <laughs> and uh, um, at, uh, you know, sometime in my, you know, middle of my career not long ago, I decided to um, see if I could investigate. And I showed up at this little village where he died in France. And because the story had really been sort of so pushed aside and erased for so long, um, I was actually lucky enough to find, even there in the village, an incredible uh, trove of documents that got me going, including the one on which the Count of Monte Cristo is actually based, which was this handwritten description of life in the dungeon, not written by the son, not, not the novel, but actually a report that the father wrote right when he was liberated from the dungeon and that he left in the town, in which when this young boy grew, grew up and became a novelist, he used this as the basis for Edmund's ordeals in the dungeon. So anyway, uh, that's how I began rewriting his back into history. Thanks. <laughs>